Our first speaker is Sam butler Sloss from the Wellbeing Economy Alliance. So Sam is well be uh, the Wellbeing Economy Alliance Scotland's youth lead. He was on the YLDP two years ago and has just finished university. He is very interested in how we can catalyze economic systems change to bring about social justice on a healthy planet. So over to you, Sam. I think we all, all know in the climate context, time is quite short, so I'm going to dive straight into it. We're living through a moment of, of profound change. The pandemic is, is likely to be the most pronounced social and economic upheaval of our generation. And I say upheaval well, due to the enormous uncertainty as to what kind of future will emerge from this moment. The world as we know it, also, the world as, as we know it, how we live, work, think and play is going through a dramatic remaking. COVID-19 is shifting tectonic plates along economic, social, technological and moral fault lines. What will emerge as a new normal, quote unquote, is all to play for. This is partly a moment of such profound fluidity due to the context it sits in. Over the last decade or so, we have stumbled from one crisis to the next. First came the global financial crisis, the consequences of which we still very much feel today, including its role in deepening inequality. Inequality both within and between countries, I would say is the second. Regressing democracy and the consequences of, I would say is the third. Environmental breakdown fourth, now in 2020, COVID-19. One common denominator I would highlight between these interconnected crises is the nature of our economic system. Our economy as currently designed has some pretty fundamental character flaws. I'll briefly run through four of these. It's by no means an exhaustive list. The first is diminishing marginal returns to growth. GDP is the headline measure of national success, despite it being a very poor measure of social progress. As this graph shows, when a country is in its early stages of development, more GDP is helpful for social progress, but these benefits quickly tail off. Further still, in the narrow pursuit of further GDP, much damage is often done. This damage then requires more and more activity to fix those failures. This is what we call failure demand. Economic activity that exists to patch up problems. Think security guards, CCTV cameras, oil spills, flood defense, etc. People call this uneconomic growth. It contradicts the notion of what we see as progress. The third character flaw is we stunningly misprice so much of economic activity. For example, the cost of carbon intensive activities on society is not reflected in the price you pay. As a result, society and future generations pick up the bill. The fourth character flaw, economic power too often equals political power. Incumbents, those that status quo serves well, have the power to effectively resist change. And it means there's an awkward chicken or egg situation whereby economic change is very difficult without political change and political change is very difficult without economic change. But these design failures are by no means inevitable, despite very pervasive. Alternatives do exist. The wellbeing economy offers an alternative, a vision for an economy that delivers social justice on a healthy planet. Well, don't we all want that? Sure. And the question you're right to ask is how do we get there? At the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, our attention goes in to how can we redesign the economy to work, around first time, work well first time around, rather than needing so many short-term fixes. It stands in stark contrast to our current way of thinking in, and our current way of doing, so much of which is in the political and economic territory of sticking plaster. I say the word radical, um, and it denotes going to the root or origin of a problem. This is what I believe we must do today, and this is what the vision for a wellbeing economy seeks to do. 
Of course, shifting the economic system is by no means straightforward, but nevertheless, here are eight ideas to start to address the character, character flaws I've just discussed. And again, by no means an, an exhaustive list, and I'm sure it'll, it'll be really developed throughout the session. Number one, change the purpose, change the goal. O offering a repurposing of the economy speaks to the very root of the problem. The effects of changing a goal would ripple throughout the economy as what we perceive as success and what we measure as success determines what we do. Number two, challenge the reigning mental models. In my eyes, the climate emergency is also a conceptual emergency. Our current ways of thinking are not up to the job. We need to move attention upstream. This has to enter the mainstream of decision making, decision makers' mental models. Three, shifting the tax base from taxing goods, good things such as work, to bad things such as pollution and externalities. And it ensures prices actually capture the cost on society. Four, a new wave of democratization. We need to put the public into public institutions. We need much more citizens' participation in the formation of politics. Deliberative democracy is proving an effective way to do so. And this wave, and this wave of democracy should not stop at the marketplace. Employee ownership and governance, as we will hear later, will be an important part of this future of the economy. Five, leverage public money to strategically steer the economy around new goals. Invest in things this crisis has exposed that matter most to society, be that health, income security, education, mobility, access to nature, social connections, and so on. Six, shine a light on the pioneers. Whether that's innovative ownership models or local policies, these, crucially, these demonstrate feasibility and overcome the natural skepticism change is inevitably met with. Seven, be an activist. Profound social and economic change is usually won on moral grounds. I suspect the climate emergency will be no different. Eight, stay a learner. All facts have half-lives. Part of today's problem is key decision makers still believe the same things as they did four decades ago despite a radically different world and despite much empirical evidence stacked against them. As a generation, we cannot afford to fall into this trap. Crucially, these points, uh, these ideas point to the imperative for this to come from a number of different angles, from a number of different levels, from the micro to the individual, there is a part for everyone. What are our chances of success, you might ask? That is successfully delivering justice on a healthy planet. I would say improbable. The challenge is enormous. The currents of the status quo are powerful and time is very short. Of course, this should only motivate, serve to motivate those that believe in redesign. Chance, the chances are anything but determined. When looking at how we can bolster our chances of this crisis leading to intentional long-term change, the RSA points to three conditions. Do, the, do these apply today? Number one, the demand and capacity for change existed before the crisis. I think, think this was certainly the case. Um, a number of polls pointed to just how despondent and disillusioned so much of the public was with the status quo. This is a global poll, but it suggested that over 50% of people in developed countries think they'll be no better off in five years. The second condition is in the crisis, the demand for change increases. And we see a prefiguring of the future that might be. Again, I think polls suggest the same thing. This YouGov poll illustrated 82% of Scotland wanted the government to prioritise wellbeing and health while only 12% picked GDP. But perhaps more importantly, we've begun to see what that different future might look like be that cities free of pollution, a reinvigorated sense of communities, returning to local economies and so on. Then finally, the third, effective and practical coalitions form. They unite behind a shared vision and have the power and ideas 
to drive through change. This right here is the task. It's going to require us to collaborate and come together like we have never before. We All Scotland is here to help, help bring together those different parts of the puzzle to drive economic systems change. A different future is in reach. Let's use this moment wisely. Thank you very much, folks, and do get in touch. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Sam. That was really interesting. Um, just a quick note to say that Q&A will be after our first three speakers, so feel free to type your questions in the box at any time. So now we have Jack Barry from Zero Waste Scotland. Jack has worked on a range of radical sustainable technologies all over the world and now works as a circular economy policy analyst for Zero Waste Scotland. With a PhD in the circular economy, Jack now also lectures at the University of Strathclyde and has recently published a thought piece around how to end Scotland's contribution to climate change. So take it away, Jack. So hi everyone, uh, I'm Jack and I'm uh, the Circular Economy Policy Analyst for Zero Waste Scotland. And today I'm gonna to talk to you a bit more nuanced about the principles for how we can consume within a wellbeing economy. And just a caveat before I start, um, a lot of this is drawn from the findings from the Decoupling Advisory Group, which is an expert group that I set up, um, a group of experts from around Scotland uh, who come together to think about how we can consume sustainably within a well-being economy in Scotland. So definitely urge you to look at that report. So Sam gave an amazing introduction to the well-being and, and a good call to arms. And I think it's worth just going over the definition of well-being economy for those who haven't seen it before. And uh, well, a well-being economy ensures an equitable distribution of wealth, health and well-being whilst protecting the planet's resources for future generations. And that's the real key nugget that I'm going to focus on today is how do we make sure equitable distribution happens whilst and simultaneously protecting the planet's resources, which is a really difficult balance to, to address. So why is resource consumption so important topic within the well-being agenda and well-being debate? Well, here we can see the global flow of materials through the economic system. From the left, where it's extracted all the way through, where it's processed, refined, manufactured, and thrown out as waste. And for the first time in history, humanity actually crossed over the 100 billion tons uh, mark in terms of consumption of resources. This is a staggering amount of resources. Think 1.7 million North Road bridges, uh, which is really even hard to grasp thinking of that. And this huge consumption resources is massively important in the climate and biodiversity debate. It accounts for around 50% of global uh, emissions and around 90% of biodiversity loss. And that's uh, largely due to land use change and waste on the other side. So it's a hugely important topic to address if we want to solve this problem. A bit closer to home actually, about four fifths of Scotland's carbon footprint is actually comprised and linked to our consumption of resources and materials. And that's a really huge amount when you consider uh, a much smaller amount is actually to do with our energy grid. So we could go 100% renewable energy and still have a sizable carbon footprint, which is linked to our consumption of materials. So a lot of mainstream economists and a lot of politicians are now calling for green growth as the kind of main solution to building back better and addressing this dichotomy of uh, delivering well-being whilst reducing consumption. Is this the right thing? Uh, well, this week actually you see world leaders over 70 signed a pledge to accelerate the transition to sustainable growth and decouple it from resource use. So what does sustainable growth mean? What does green growth mean? And what does decoupling mean? And is it even feasible? Well, the best way to show this is through this graph. So on your y-axis is growth and on your x-axis is time. And over time, we see economic activity going up. That's your economic growth measured by GDP. 
Now, some people call for greener kind of greener growth, which is which means basically that as your economic activity increases a lot, your consumption of resources and your environmental impact grows, but slightly less less faster rate, and that's what you call relative decoupling. The other term is green growth, which is absolute decoupling. That means when your economic activity grows, but your use of uh, resources and your environmental impact plateaus and actually starts to drop. So it decouples its relationship from growth. Now, the reality is that's kind of where uh, politicians and, and economists, mainstream economists sit. But actually what we need is green enough growth. And that's sufficient decoupling at a rate fast enough to fit within our planetary boundaries. And that is much faster than the current conception of what green growth is. In fact, if we, if we plot our current progress to date, it's virtually zero. Um, and this is a, a good case in point is we only recycle 9% of the 100 billion tons we currently consume per year. If we were to achieve green growth, that's the green line, not even the red line, we'd need to be reusing 80 to 90% of those resources. So we're nowhere near. In fact, even the UN outlined that uh, we failed for the second decade in a row to meet any target on nature loss. And in a brilliant report by the Environmental European Environmental Bureau, which is a collection of 180 organizations around Europe, has shown that there's no ev satisfactory evidence to show that we've achieved decoupling of economic activity to environmental impact fast enough to remain within the planetary boundaries. So I think it's safe to say green growth has nowhere near been achieved to date. Uh, but is it just? Well, the decoupling advisory group found that green growth, even if they succeed in driving the green agenda, it might make the economy marginally greener under the growth scenario, but not necessarily fairer. And a good example of that is within the UK carbon policy, low carbon policy, where through renewable energy subsidies and household retrofits, bills increased by 13%. But for the high income earners, it only meant a 1.5% spend, whereas for low income households, that's, that equated to a 10% spend. Um, so there's a huge difference in terms of justice around even existing environmental policies. And then further to that, uh, what's really missing in the green growth discussion is the, the complexities around systemic injustices. And these, there's various different types of injustices from distributive, so how are the costs and benefits of green growth policies and actions distributed, procedural justices, so who has influence, who decides, and obviously rights and justice, how are marginalized views and narratives incorporated into environmental policy making. So the Just Transition Commission are an excellent example of starting to address this challenge of injustice within the, the kind of green transition. Um, but I'm, I wanna make the point that we need the exact same for the material economy, which accounts for a huge amount of environmental impact and carbon emissions. So as well as not really being achieved to date and also not implicitly addressing systemic injustices, green growth as a concept is gonna face a huge amount of ongoing challenges in the future. I don't have time to list these. Uh, I'd recommend you go into the decoupling advisory group report to read on these. But one example is rebound effect, um, where you, know, you create a more fuel efficient car, means you drive further, or with that saving, you buy a flight to Spain to go on holiday. And the whole global economic system is set up, built on efficiencies. Everything becomes more efficient, therefore you save more money and you consume more. Uh, so these are really inherent basic building blocks of the current economic system, which means that even if it's green, the growth agenda will get really stuck in all of these dynamics. And it's a really significant hurdle to overcome. So, I kind of want to align with Sam here, you know, what's clear is green growth, I don't think personally is going to solve the issues that we're facing. Um, even if it's got the term green in front of it, as the late Donnell Meadows said, if you define the goal of society or our economy as growth, then society will do its best to produce growth. It will not produce welfare, equity, justice, efficiency, and so on. So what we need to do is recreate a new goal for our economy, which I would suggest is uh, pursuing collective well-being within a uh, sustainable environment. But how do we do that? Well, we need principles for sustainable consumption. 
if we're going to transition to a well-being economy, make sure uh, key injustices are addressed and people live to the full extent in a prosperous life, then they need to be able to consume sustainably as well. So the first point is, for Scotland, we need to reduce our consumption, absolutely. That means our consumption of materials in total needs to plateau and then drop rapidly. Uh, by rapidly, I mean fast enough to fit within not only the current uh, environmental agreements such as the Paris Agreement, but also to meet with all of the planetary boundaries. So that's a really rapid drop in consumption. We need to do it permanently. And this is one of the key things that's always missed in policy is you get a short term win, uh, win and then you'll see a rebound again. We're seeing that with COVID with people going back to cars uh, and an increase in, in pollution in cities. So how do you lock in long term uh, consumption reduction? And then finally, we need to reduce our consumption in a fair and just manner and consider the risk of any policy in shifting these environmental burdens uh, of our consumption to other countries and marginalized communities. And I've listed a few kind of very simple things we can do right now to, to reduce this in, in a fair, fair manner, but I don't have time to go into those, but you'll have the slides afterwards. So to, to sum up, what needs to be done? It's, it's actually very similar to what Sam was saying. Um, what I think we need to do is open a public debate. Um, so I'm obviously presenting here, but I'm just one voice, and we need to get as many voices from as many backgrounds and lived experiences as possible and open a public debate around the topic of consumption and overconsumption and how it's unsustainable, unethical, or unjust and unfair. We need to design governance institutions to allow for social uh, experiments, engagement, and disruptive innovation. And the Citizens Assembly is a perfect example of how we're starting to enable that to happen, but we need to do far more, far quicker, at a more local uh, uh, manner. We need to strengthen equality and redistribution, and we can do that through sustainability taxes, basic income, shorter working weeks, job guarantees, and deliver this through more effective and community social wealth building. We need to really rapidly deploy the sharing economy, support business models, and community groups and interest groups that encourage sharing in the giving economy, support local well-being projects, which Sam laid out. And then kind of my final point I want to end on, which is the National Performance Framework, which for those of you who are not aware, it's a policy framework that the Scottish government uses uh, to measure its progress on a wealth of different well-being indicators. And what I think needs to happen to that is it needs to be much more deeply integrated into our policy-making process in a transparent way uh, that we can tie all of our policies to these goals themselves rather than growth by itself. Um, so that's a really, really key thing to be done. And then final, just some useful resources. I'm sure these slides will be shared, but if you want any more information, feel free to see these reports or speak to me afterwards. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you so much, Jack. So next we have Charlotte Hartley. So Charlotte works for Pale Blue Dot Energy and sits on 2050 Climate Group's Board of Trustees and represents our charity on the Scottish Just Transition Commission and the IPPR Environmental Justice Commission, which are focused on the transition to a net zero economy in a fair and sustainable way. Charlotte also sits on the committee for the Energy Institute Young Professionals Network in Aberdeen. So over to you, Charlie. Thank you, Faye. Thank you for having me, me today. Um, I don't have any slides today. I've got some speaker notes here. So if you find me looking to the side, that is all I am looking at. Um, and I wanted to speak to you today about what the Just Transition Commission for Scottish Government is doing, why it exists and um, view our transition to net zero and the impacts on the economy in a slightly different way to the kind of well-being economy approach. Um, so what are the principles, before I move on to what the Commission is, I thought I would cover what the principles are that we are um, aligning ourselves and aligning our work to you as part of the Commission's activity. Um, so Just Transition is an important part of the climate justice debate um, that is specifically focused on the economy. Um, we have kind of three key, we summarise this in the Just Transition Commission in three, three areas. 
And the first is to plan, invest and implement a transition to environment, environmentally and socially sustainable jobs, sectors and economies, building on our economic and work, Scotland's economic and workforce strengths and potential going forward. Secondly, we want to create opportunities to develop resource efficient and sustainable economic approaches, which help to address inequality and poverty. And thirdly, to design and deliver low carbon investment and infrastructure and make all possible efforts to create decent, fair, high value work in a way that does not negatively affect the current workforce and the overall economy. And for the avoidance of any doubt, we want to do all of this um, on our transition to in a net zero context by 2045 in Scotland. So the Just Transition Commission was formed in January of 2019, following a num um, number of years of, kind of preparatory work to advise on transitioning to a net zero economy in Scotland in a fair and sustainable way. We've been meeting with different sectors and communities throughout Scotland since our inception, gathering evidence to inform our thinking, which goes into Scottish government ministers. The purpose of the Commission is to provide practical, realistic and affordable recommendations to the ministers that maximise the economic and social opportunities that the transition offers, to build on our existing strengths and assets, and to understand and mitigate the risk that could arise throughout the process, in particular in areas such as regional cohesion, fuel poverty and creating inclusive labour markets. So what have we been up to? Um, well, like other groups, we've had to adapt the way that we work and continue moving forward as best we can in the current environment. In February of this year, we published our interim report. In some ways that feels like just yesterday, but in other, in other ways, a completely different time. Um, we, at that point in February, we also went out for a public consultation to seek views on not only our interim report, but also of the public's view of just transition um, at that time. And 2050 Climate Group compiled a response based on um, a great amount of feedback that they received from our following. So that has been really great too. Knowing that the impact of COVID-19 has not been felt equally across society in a similar way that the our traditional economy has set up, is not felt equally across society. Marginalized groups have been hit the hardest. And in June, we were tasked by Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham to specifically look into this issue. We were asked to look at the equity aspects of a green recovery and to build on the work done by a number of other organizations, such as the Climate Emergency Response Group, who I believe you'll be hearing from um, after this session. We identified several actions for the government to consider as part of a just and green recovery. And I'm going to spend the rest of my presentation going through the highlights from that report and some of what we found. And um, so as part of our green recovery, we called for an economic recovery that is aligned with our climate ambitions. The 2030 and 2045 targets are still legislated. They haven't gone anywhere. We have an opportunity to reset our progress in a way that also actively tackles inequality and promotes regional cohesion in Scotland. As part of our work preparing our kind of green recovery thinking, we spoke to a wide range of stakeholders and groups, the Advisory Group on Economic Recovery, the Climate Emergency Response Group. And with all of this work and our interim report and what we had found through the Just Transition Commission's interim um, work so far, we identified four key hotspots, areas which were particularly at risk through the impacts of COVID. And firstly, we find that young people are especially at risk. Patterns of transport use have changed and the long-term behavior changes are unknown. Um, as Jack said in, in his presentation, the you know, behavior fluctuations throughout the pandemic, it's unknown what the impacts are on long-term individual behavior. And that creates a challenge for government and local authorities to plan for infrastructure. I know in Aberdeen, um, where I live, the 
um, active travel infrastructure has rapidly increased, but at the moment it's in quite a temporary way with a lot of like traffic cones and things because the local council, they can't prepare for what is going to be permanent infrastructure changes just yet. Um, thirdly, through our green recovery work, we found that there was an, an accelerated transition unfolding in the oil and gas sector. And fourthly, and finally, some of Scotland's rural sectors and regions are, have been particularly hard hit by the transition um, through by COVID and will need particular attention and focus as we can progress through this transitional period. So the recommendations that we gave as part of our um, into cabinet secretaries for the green recovery, we made give six recommendations building on the kind of four areas that we found were particularly at risk. Firstly, that we significantly need to increase our investment in home efficiency to create warmer homes that are more fuel efficient and more generally efficient and cost people less to run. We need to back buses and support the supply chain, particularly in public transport areas who've been hard hit during, during the um, pandemic. We need to help the rural economy by helping Scotland's nature. We need to invest further in biodiversity and in public green spaces so that they are available for use and in a sustainable way. We need to maintain and create new jobs for oil and gas workers who are displaced by the transition to ensure that they that people who are currently in high value work have other high value work that they can move into, which is lower carbon. And um, we need to align skills development for both young people and old people with a net zero transition at the heart of what this skills development is. And finally, all government funding, which becomes available to businesses and other types of organizations, have a clear sense of direction and they have conditions attached, which are all of a net zero context. And so just before I wrap up, I wanted to hone in um, this group. We are a youth charity. We are all, I'm assuming most of us on this call are young people. Um, and young people was one of the hotspots in our green recovery work. We've seen nationwide through the pandemic, a number of school closures. Um, we're also now seeing a lot of challenges arising with students at university. What does the future hold? We have longer term uncertainty on how their social, social mobility is affected and how attainment levels will be affected by the transition, by um, this challenging period and certainly like as a as a young person myself I know that when I entered the job market it was competitive and going forward it's going to be even harder and for students university or further education students at the moment and also school age students the environment that they are coming into there is so much uncertainty around that um, as a result of all of that impact on education and what is happening in that area, we also found that um, young people's mental health was, was more vulnerable than other, other groups um, throughout the, the kind of areas that we explored as part of our green recovery. So with that in mind, um, I just wanted to wrap up my presentation today with a bit of a kind of positive call to action and um, to absolutely replicate what Sam said in his first presentation the main thing that I can tell that I can encourage people to do is to stay a learner <laughs> I articulated it differently Sam articulates it much better keep learning um, and to take advantage of the skills development opportunities that are available. Scottish Government already have announced a number of packages available, skills development packages, either professional development, apprenticeships, all focused on um, the just transition, um, all focused on net zero with just transition principles in its heart. Um, in 2018, the OPITO organization, which is actually a skills organization for the oil and gas industry, they shared that by 2035 in that industry, there will be a requirement for 40,000 new jobs. 
um, of which 10,000 don't exist yet. Now, without getting into a discussion about what the future of the oil and gas industry holds, that report was formed on, on how kind of powered energy demand was change, would change. But what I want to focus on is that 10,000 of which don't exist yet. And I think what if we, we need to be taking advantage of all different skills opportunities that arise and keep learning in order to remain as diverse as we can so that we can move into these jobs which we don't know exist yet. Um, and I think that is what really kind of is reflected in the pandemic, the level of uncertainty that we face and what our recommendations to Scottish Government are is to try and address and kind of mitigate some of the risk presented by the transition in wh whatever shape or form it takes and through the pandemic, whatever form that continues to take, that keep learning, keep exploiting development and opportunities. And um, I will leave it there. And I'd like to open the floor up for, well, pass back to Faye, presumably open the floor for discussion. <laughs> You're absolutely right. <laughs> thank you so much, Charlie. That was really, really interesting. And thank you for stressing the importance of getting young people into work and also just to continue to learn. So yes, now we will be moving on to Q&A. So if you have any last minute questions, then please pop them in the chat box or raise your hand or thumbs up. Um, but to start off, I have a question here, and this is for Charlotte and Jack, and it is, what role do zero carbon buildings play in just transition for Scotland? I guess I could start on that. Uh, well, first to caveat, I'm not an expert in, in buildings and construction per se, but um, what I do know is uh, I did a, a piece of work which I actually put up on Twitter, which was um, a collection of all the 300 plus recommendations made by a huge range of different organizations for Scotland's green recovery. And green building and retrofit was one of the top, uh, most numerously quoted uh, demands uh, out of all of them. Um, it accounts for a huge proportion of our carbon footprint um, and particularly around the use of concrete, uh, which is massively energy intensive. So uh, energy efficiency with, within buildings is critical and uh, there's a lot of work now ramping up in that. But what's more important is we, we think about the system of living that we want to design. So do we want sprawling suburbs with full of energy efficient houses or do we want much denser city living where you're not building as many buildings, you've got much denser communities, uh, more chance for interaction and community spirit, but also far less uh, material demand and energy demand. So as, as important as green energy, uh, green buildings are and energy efficiency is in buildings, what's more important is the question of planning reform that will, which will build the, the next stock of housing for the next 30, 40 years. And that is critical and there's a, the rev revision of the uh, national planning framework uh, coming up in the Scottish policy landscape. Um, and it's critical uh, that this framework considers how we live as a society and then building around that to be sustainable rather than just focusing on sustainable materials or you know, energy efficient buildings. It's the way we live has to be questioned first. Thank you, Jack. Yeah, um, I would really echo Jack's comments. And the other thing that I would add on that, um, Jack mentioned that we need to look at system design, um, which is absolutely correct. But in terms of a just transition con concept where we are so focused on, um, the, on jobs, um, I'd say that we really need system designers. <laughs> um, and there's a real transition opportunity here to look at the way we design to well 
firstly to look at the way we design our buildings particularly um, the just transition commission have particularly looked at the way we use public buildings um, such as hospitals and schools and libraries and how the efficiency in those can be improved which of course when we have more efficient buildings the cost of running them comes down um, but our transition to net zero needs a lot of ways of working and ways of thinking and ways of planning and designing and engineering which are very different to what we have had before and there is a huge exciting um, economic and personal career opportunity in all of these different areas in a way that hasn't really existed before um, and you know we've see, we see or certainly what I see here is that new home develop new residential developments are built very quickly um, and how can we adapt that how can we look at are they being built in the best way that they can be using you know are they using sustainable materials I don't know um, but there's a real scope for centralizing just transition and net zero the climate emergency at the heart of all of this planning activity which is taking place and really I think the reality is that things which are already committed, what level of influence is there to have? I'm not sure, but we have a real opportunity to look at everything going forward, everything that is in its development phase and look at like, are we designing these in the best way that we can be? And who are the best people to be designing them? Who has the innovative approaches which are as sustainable as they can be? Can I, can I just add one more thing, Faye, if that's okay, uh, I'm sorry. Um, which is, is a really important point that we try to make at Zero Waste Scotland is the so the net zero target it only accounts for our territorial emissions so the emissions produced yeah. within the national borders um, and that makes about half of our carbon footprint the other half is produced from the goods and services we import from abroad huge amount of building materials we import from abroad to build our buildings so one of the things we really need to do is start looking at the domestic resources we have in Scotland, whether that's wood sourced in a sustainable way, uh, as, as well as uh, deconstructing and dismantling existing buildings to build new buildings, um, so that we stop importing carbon intensive and environmentally destructive materials. And we need to do it fast because it's not covered in the Paris Agreement and net zero target, these emissions. So they will escape uh, kind of review. So it's, it's a big gap in the net zero target, it's something we need to really push for change. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Jack and Charlie. So I've got another question here from John Redshaw. Uh, we talk about a just transition where we are focusing on zero carbon, but it is the just transition just as much as delivering the UN SDGs, both nationally and internationally. Um, so the Scottish Government are focused on the sustainable development goals, but um, potentially a bit of a um, kind of short answer to a really good question. The Just Transition Commission have not been tasked with embedding the sustainable development goals into the recommendations that we provide to them. Um, we've been asked solely to focus on um, our net zero, our transition to net zero in a fair and sustainable way. Um, so I'm not sure if that's a simple answer to that question about what the Commission is doing. Um, and I'll open up if either of Jack or Sam um, want to speak on kind of well-being and its fit with sustainable development goals. Sam, do you have something to add or I'll... I think you're on mute. <laughs> yes, I don't, I'm not sure I, I fully captured the question, but I, if it is, I, I would say that it's extremely important we kind of um, posit our notion of a ju just transition, both in a national and international context. Uh, and one example of doing that, I, I think would be around these production boundaries, emission boundaries, as Jack just talked about, among others. Yeah, and, and I guess the, the, I guess what I take from the question is you're saying that the just 
transition commission's kind of focusing in Scotland, this is Scotland specific focus, whereas our impact is global. So we need to really bridge that gap between the two. Um, and that's where, yeah, okay, consumption and territorial emissions reporting needs to be figured out quickly. Um, but uh, the, the point of my presentation was to say that um, if we don't absolutely start reducing our consumption, what we do is we just keep exporting our environmental impact abroad. Um, and that's what environmental impacts all the injustices. And, and Scotland has, you know, one of the founders of the Industrial Revolution has a long heritage of exporting its environmental impact. Um, and so we really need to get a key on how many materials we're mining from where, how much we're importing, uh, how much waste we're exporting, measuring all of that, trying to reduce all of it and trying to source stuff from locally. But also we have a moral responsibility to work with these more developing regions of the world to share our knowledge, to share expertise, to share resources, to share stories uh, and work in partnership with them. Um, uh, both to help them and for them to help us. It's, it's a global community. And so the, the Just Transition Commission is doing amazing work in Scotland, but there's, no, there's nothing to stop the learnings from that at a domestic level to be shared around other countries and, and really promote that. Brilliant, thank you so much, everyone. I think we have time for one more question. If we manage to keep the answers um, as concise as possible. So there is one question from Scott and Jana that say, one idea that struck me was the need to reframe the metrics we use to measure success. For example, away from GTP and current definitions of growth. Do the speakers have any suggestions on how we as individuals can contribute to this reframing? For example, in our individual actions or workplaces. Um, I, I can go first. I, well, it's just um, uh, I think four things. First is to talk to a friend. Uh, ideas um, spread through conversations. Second is kind of, second and third would be policy world. R write to your MP, elected an MP that is challenging this conventional notion of growth. Um, and the fourth important aspect is actually how journalism covers all this. We're right to a journalist you read, uh, in an economics journalist perhaps, and suggest that they're missing the point here. here that when they report the quarterly budget, they're missing the most important dimension. That'd be my four ideas. Yeah, I'm sure Sammy summed it up perfectly there. I don't really have anything to add apart from the really key thing is just get involved, learn, read up about it, um, and get involved in groups. Uh, there's loads of groups forming all over Scotland, uh, community level, get involved in your community where you can really, you know, undertake well-being actions from the get-go and you can see instant progress. So don't just get stuck in the high level global economics debate and, you know, get down and dirty and, and get started today with community groups. Definitely, you've got nothing to add on top of those two comments. Brilliant, thank you so much to so Jack, Charlie and Sam. Um, I noticed that there are a few more questions in the chat box. Um, if it's possible, I would ask our speakers to look over them and if they want to, they are more than welcome to reply to them in the chat box. I am conscious that we need to get everyone out for a quick break. So we are planning to resume at three o'clock exactly. So if you can get back then, that would be brilliant. In the meantime, get out, stretch your legs, take your eyes away from the screen and we'll see you back here soon. Um, so welcome back everyone. Um, I hope you're feeling refreshed after that really short break. Um, I wanted to start off by introducing myself. My name is Alex. I'm taking over from the lovely Faye for the second half of this event. I want to say a big thank you to the speakers that we've had so far. Um, 
In this second half of the event, we've got a brand new panel of speakers who are going to be looking at some of the pragmatic ways to make the economy more just and sustainable. We're going to hear about the kind of training programs and skills that will be needed for a greener economy and what the jobs of the future may look like. Then we'll hear about community ownership and how it can transform the energy industry and local economies. And we'll also hear about the role of trade unions um, and um, the campaign for climate justice. It is after all trade unions who came up with the idea of a just transition. I'm gonna start off by introducing our first speaker who is Robin Parker. Robin was formerly the president of the National Union of Students and then worked for WWF Scotland um, where he worked on Scotland's most recent Climate Change Act and Climate Change Plan. He was also part of the Secretariat delivering the Climate Emergency Response Groups and report on key actions for Scotland's response to climate change. So over to you, Robin. Hello, thanks very much, Alex. And uh, yeah, definitely um, consider myself a friend of the 2050 programme. So it's uh, it's great to be here with you all and, uh, and uh, speaking to you all. Um, let me get my uh, presentation up. Um, yeah, so hopefully you can all see that. And um, when I was thinking about uh, which, uh, what, what slide I'd put up first and, and what I'd show to you first, I think there's any kind of, there's any number of kind of graphs or figures uh, that I could have put up to, to show you just the scale, I think, of the economic challenge that, that we're facing at the moment. Um, this particular uh, graphs from IPPR Scotland um, and just kind of focuses on the youth youth unemployment side of the challenge that we face. Um, as you can see, the kind of the figure that that picks out, that they picked out from that was that, that we need to create about 100,000 opportunities for young people um, just in Scotland over the next year or so, um, whether that's in education, uh, jobs uh, or, or training, just, just to make sure that those people don't go into youth unemployment. Um, just sort of making it slightly personal for a moment. Um, I graduated university in uh, in 2010, and um, really soon after after the last financial crisis. And to help give you a sense of scale, um, if you look at that graph around the 2010 2011 point, and um, that's when you, Scotland was really seeing a really high rate of youth unemployment, and what as we felt it at the time. Um, and in order to bring that number down, um, this was the kind of the time that I was involved with the National Union of Students in Scotland. And it was, uh, it was pretty much the, the political focus when it came to the economy was the issue of youth unemployment and bringing it down. Um, the, only, the only thing eclipsing it was, was the upcoming um, independence referendum at the time. So that sort of gives you a sense of scale that the, the economic recession in 2008 for my generation that was something that was really impactful um, for many people in terms of what they did uh, coming out of education and um, the lack of opportunities they faced it was a massive political focus those sorts of things and the scale of what we're going into is is potentially sort of coming up to it for twice the size of that and um, what I'll, uh, I'll go on to my next slide and what I'm going to talk about um, actually, last thing on this slide is just to say that um, obviously that's just putting up the youth unemployment side of the economic challenge. And that's before you get to some of the other ways that um, I think we'll really see all aspects of inequality uh, exacerbated. Um, and we'll see, um, we've seen kind of those jobs that are precarious jobs anyway, um, be most impacted by the economic situation we're seeing. And there's also di very different geographical impacts. So I think when we're thinking about the role of um, tackling net, uh, getting to net zero, the race to net zero, tackling climate change alongside the economic side of things, the, there's a whole bunch of different economic issues, the kind of inequality issue, the, the, the opportunity creation issue, um, and the kind of geographical impacts that we've really got to have in mind when we're thinking about what the policy solutions are. Um, the first thing I'm going to talk about um, in terms of solutions um, is some work I was involved with with the, uh, the Climate Emergency Response Group. Um, and this was back uh, probably sort of to, uh, late summer, so sort of August. Uh, that's when, when this stuff was getting published. Um, and I'll talk you th So the Climate Emergency Response Group is kind of a, a classic group of Scottish people who are kind of the great and the good, a um, bunch of kind of business leaders, um, 
organizations involved in kind of delivering climate change programs and this group and uh, some NGO folk and, and the, these people came together um, and asked the secretariat that included myself to kind of put together some uh, proposals about how um, the climate emergency uh, and responding to the climate emergency could be aligned with um, the, the economic recovery that we needed just, just now. So I've kind of, um, unhelpfully, the, it was uh, titled Eight Policy Packages, and I've, I've not put a, a list of eight things up on the screen. You'll see the exact uh, list of eight, but kind of in really focusing on the jobs and skills bit, um, I wanted to talk about kind of three um, linked areas that I, th I think came out in, in that report um, about ways, ways of responding uh, to it. Um, so the first one is um, around uh, a kind of direct economic stimulus. So this is about, this is your classic, like, uh, there's uh, the economies on on the down. Let's let's fire the government, the public sector, the taxpayer uh, fires more money into the economy to directly create jobs. And it, it's important both because it directly creates jobs, uh, but also because it's a way of putting money back into people's pockets that they then go out and spend on other things. So it's, it's beneficial um, to the economy in that sense, in that wider sense too. And there's a kind of a, a joke that goes around economic circles where the, and this is this is a built off the work of an economist um, back in the, the middle of the 20th century called John Maynard Keynes um, and uh, Keynesian economics. The idea is that um, when when the economy is on the down, one of the things you should do is, is the government steps in and creates more stuff. So they talk about digging a hole and then green Keynesians talking about uh, digging a hole and then putting a tree in it. So. You, both the, the, the government paying to do stuff, but also making sure that's that's good stuff that the, that, that we need from a, both an environmental uh, point of view and an economic point of view. And um, so some of the things that the Climate Emergency Response Group picked out, um, I heard you mentioning the sort of the building side of, of things towards the end of the last session. Um, and so, um, yeah, the improving the stock of uh, Scotland's existing stuff, of stock of buildings and homes. Uh, that's a massive challenge. We've got a very leaky stock uh, of buildings. They're very inefficient. A lot of the, the money and the carbon we spend heating them leaks straight back out into the atmosphere. So improving the energy efficiency, that's a big piece of work and something where particularly for poorer homes and um, the government putting money in and supporting those people to invest in their own buildings, that, that's a really good uh, use of public money. Secondly, uh, a big challenge around, uh, sorry, around buildings as well. There's a big thing about also uh, we need to get into the space where we're, we're replacing the heat sources. Uh, so we're moving away from gas boilers and we're replacing gas boilers uh, with uh, air source heat pumps and um, with district heating and those sorts of things. Labor intensive, important investment things. And again, something where we can put money in and it, it creates jobs and it uh, delivers, delivers on our path to net zero. Second uh, group of things around um, the city side of things. Um, and there's a there's a big chunk of work there around uh, active travel, walking and cycling and wheeling um, and uh, around heat again, district heating and that this concept that the climate emergency response group wants to talk about about 20 minute neighborhoods where you can reach everything you need with a t within a 20 minute walk of your of your home. Rural jobs, another really big thing um, a real big opportunity, really important that the public sector invests in uh, tree planting and restoring peatlands um, and changing our, our land. Um, and that's something, again, that the Climate Emergency Response Group saw as a, as a place that public sector money could be put in to create jobs uh, in that area directly. Uh, secondly, Serg talked about a, a bunch of things around skills um, that I want to come to. Um, so they talked about a climate and nature emergency services uh, service program. And um, so sort of setting out something for, for school leavers here. So I'll, I'll sort of go through them chronologically almost. So school leavers, giving them an alternative to the kind of gap year. Uh, where they could go out and deliver some of that environmental work, kind of get that um, link, link to, to the environment, and do some of those, those outdoor rural things as, as a replacement for your kind of classic gap, gap year sort of thing. Um, next thing they picked on was kind of green modern apprenticeships um, and really coming at this in a, in a different way to we, the way we deliver a lot of the apprenticeship program at the moment. Um, really making sure that uh, you kind of had a really, a really strong element of, of off the job learning as part of your apprenticeship. And so that you didn't just learn about kind of the, your job as it existed at the moment, but in a classroom setting as well, you, you learn a wider set of skills about where, those, where the, that job might go in the, in the future. And um, also looking at breaking up um, apprenticeships, so you might get to work with more than one employer and that would be a way of uh, getting more employers involved and therefore expanding the number of apprenticeships on offer. Um, also talked about additional college and university places, particularly uh, focused on those areas where we know that we'll need an expanding workforce going forward. 
um, and also building into all kind of college and university uh, work kind of um, a focus on uh, on the climate climate skills in general. And lastly, a kind of a specific reskilling sort of issue around um, supporting folk who wanted to move from the renewable sector into um, uh, from sorry kind of being made unemployed in the oil and gas sector and wanted needed support to get into the renewable sector. Um, and then lastly, a set of things around uh, the kind of private sector and supporting the private sector to uh, create jobs. So um, seeing uh, coronavirus as a kind of a, a massive disruption to the economy and that creating an opportunity for a lot more types of jobs to be created. So supporting entrepreneurs uh, with some of the the um, creating new business models to um, fill some of those new opportunities being created by this kind of massive shakeup of the economy that we're seeing just now. Um, also something that was kind of really big for the group was a kind of long-term policy certainty. So for businesses, knowing where the economy will be in sort of 10 years time, that's really important because they, they have to think that far ahead when they're, they're investing in things. So uh, you need to kind of give them a, a sense of where things are going and that will enable them to invest in, in those transition things. Uh, moving on to my next slide, um, it's kind of a big rundown there of all the, uh, a whole bunch of things that were in the Scottish government's um, programme for government. So this is what uh, the Scottish government published um, at the start of September. It's kind of their work plan for um, from there until uh, the Scottish Parliament elections we'll see in May next year. Um, and it was, uh, yeah, it was really focused on um, obviously kind of responding to coronavirus and, and the economic aspects of it. Um, but I, there's this very strong green thread that, that runs through all of it. So a couple of the kind of overarching things that, that are in that document, a, a national mission to help create new good and green jobs. So thinking in, in the roundabout, yes, we've got to create new jobs, but they've also got to be uh, green jobs. They've got to, they've got to support our, our path towards net zero. They've got to be part of the future. Uh, and also they've got, to be, they've got to be good jobs. They've got to be well paid. Uh, they've got to be um, uh, jobs that, that, that are kind of high quality jobs. Another kind of key thing in there, this idea of a Scottish youth guarantee so that we're, we're seeing all of that potential for youth unemployment, uh, making sure that every young person has the opportunity of work education or training. Um, picking out, there's some, there's some big picture numbers about the amount of kind of public investment um, that the Scottish government's committed to over the next, the next years. Um, and so particularly a really big chunk of money around the building sector and addressing some of those challenges I was talking about earlier in terms of uh, energy efficiency and in terms of um, uh, transitioning to renewable heating. And then some really specific interventions around the kind of the skills side of things. So um, particularly a national transition training fund. So that, that's addressing that need to, to support, support um, uh, particularly the oil, the oil and gas sector and some of the very specific impacts that we're seeing in the northeast of Scotland from that. Um, and then, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a good document and um, you should definitely, definitely take a look at it. It's kind of the work plan for the Scottish government. Um, and it's, it's, so it, it sets out all the things that, that we're doing in Scottish government. Um, and then uh, one of the things I really want to pick out is, is the Scottish National Investment Bank. Um, that's something that will get up and running uh, later on this year. Um, and the, the, uh, the concept of the Scottish National Investment Bank is that um, what uh, it's, a, it's the ability, it's something funded by Scottish Government and it won't act just as a commercial bank. What it will do um, is support those businesses and those, those industries which aren't quite in the place yet where they can get to the position where they can um, uh, get commercial um, finance from commercial banks um, and they're kind of in that stage before that and it helps them along that journey. And it's going to be focused on uh, a kind of a mission, mission focused uh, approach. So it's going to be particularly looking at um, ha uh, how uh, to support businesses in that climate space and that, that have an important contribution to make to net zero and uh, also kind of looking at the wider social and place challenges that, that, that we have in Scotland. Uh, moving on. Ooh. Yep, so um, some general challenges and I won't talk about all of these, I don't think. Um, there's always a definitional challenge about what is a green job and that's when everyone kind of every everything is going to be impacted by the massive um, economic revolution that we need to deliver in order to get to net zero and um, so you know there, there are things that are very specific to that transition but there's also an awful lot of jobs which are going to only be affected in very minor ways like a a policewoman who goes from driving a, a, a petrol car to driving an electric 
uh, police car. Fundamentally, she's still a policewoman. I think there's also a real challenge around on the skills side of things is that traditionally um, the skills system has kind of waited until there's a demand from business and then kind of um, supported it. So there's this chicken and egg uh, issue around um, do you get the EV electric vehicles first and then you get the electric and then you make sure that we've got enough mechanics um, or do you make sure that the, the, the skills re required for that transition, do you get them there first? But the risk with that is you create your you're educating people into jobs that don't exist yet and so there's kind of always a, a fear about um uh, kind of sending people out into the kind of there's not a, there's not an end point for them um i put up who pays and how because that's a that's always a question i think for for every it's the most important question for me in in terms of climate change net zero um and then just lastly i think um the 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 last one on that list the lack of a there's an awful lot of things where it makes really good case at the moment where it's really cheap for governments to borrow uh, borrow money and um, for them to to play a big role in kind of investing more and increasing the amount of money that they're putting into the economy on a whole bunch of things and um, but uh, because of the constitutional situation the scottish government uh, ability to do that is very limited it kind of has to wait and to see what the uk government is doing on those sorts of things and then follow and um, so that kind of uh, that creates a real a real challenge around a lot of delivering a lot of the policy things that um, that we get talked about. Um, and I'm going to just show you my last slide and really just uh, stop talking because this is kind of a little scrap scrapbook of things I put together for you uh, related to the uh, kind of the the economic side of uh, the transition to to, to net zero. Um, I think the uh, two reports I would definitely recommend the CCC's work on net zero and the, the UK's part of net zero is brilliant um, it's it's big but it's a really really accessible read um, and then the the diagram at the bottom left that's from something called the um, the energy transitions commission it looks at it in kind of a much more more global way um, so yeah last thought um, it I think we need the kind of the, the conversation we need to have now is is not kind of um, how do we get to net zero? It's kind of like we need to do the action and we need to start thinking about in the on our way to net zero, how do we maximize the opportunities and make sure those opportunities are shared fairly, particularly the economic ones. Um, and then secondly, how do we protect those who are the most impacted and kind of reduce the impact on them? It's those kind of ultimately the just transition things. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robin. I find that really interesting and um, it, Thanks as well for the recommendations of further reading for us to, to look at going forward. Um, next up, we have Suzanne Jaffrey. So Suzanne is the chair of the Campaign Against Climate Change. She is a long-standing environmental activist and trade unionist. She is a contributor of the One Million Climate Jobs Report, and a a which was a pioneering report by the CACC trade union group supported by seven trade unions and this report identified how a million jobs could be created across the UK to tackle the climate and ecological crisis and um, she's also helped to organize for trade union support for the global school strike in 2019. So Suzanne over to you. Thanks, uh, thanks so much Alex and uh, thank you also um, to 2050 Climate Group for their invitation to speak um, today. Let me just fiddle around so I can. Um, um, are you seeing me? Sorry, I can't see me anymore. So, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, great. Um, yeah, so thanks so much for that invitation um, to speak. Um, I want to just start really with where Alex finished off about the global climate strike um, because it's only um, just over a year ago that the global climate strike took place and it really was um, a hugely important moment I would say both in terms of the um, capacity for us to bring about the change that we need to tackle climate change but also um, very important in terms of um, beginning to win trade unionists in a more active way to um, being part of a movement demanding uh, change and beginning to understand some of the issues and some of, some of the urgency. Um, I think that movement, the global climate strike, seeing across the course of a week, um, 
young people and trade unionists and adults in their millions walk out of their workplaces and take to the streets um, was important. And the urgency with which um, the strike was attempting to underline hasn't gone away. So um, from there to now, we see a situation in which um, the urgency uh, and the climate crisis have carried on um, un unabated. I'm really sorry, Alex. I just, I, I'm, 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 I'm just really struggling because I can't see myself and it's a little bit disorientating. So if you could just give me one second so I can try and work out what's going on. Okay, well, that will do. I can see myself in the corner of the screen. Um, okay, right, I'll, I'll carry on. I was a very little bit disorientating for me. So that climate crisis continued unabated and um, the wildfires, the climate strikes, sorry, the climate um, fires, the, floods, the impact on um, agriculture, the locust swarms in East Africa, and over and over again, that is a climate crisis um, in which, um, like the COVID crisis, the social and racial inequality and injustice is at the heart um, of the reality and the impact of, of that crisis. Um, I want to also mention the COVID crisis um, because I think that the climate and the COVID crisis have those same roots in a system which is prioritizing the interests of um, the wealth of a minority um, over the interests of the majority of the global population and um, over the interests of the health of the planet, uh, the climate and the nature um, on which we on which we rely and I think that if the crisis of climate and nature and Covid has its roots in the same place then it feels clear that we can't address those crises um, by returning back to the point at which um, those crises find their find their roots and I think this brings us, or it brings me to that question of uh, what is the role uh, of, of trade unions um, in this situation? And clearly one role has to be about the role of solidarity. And it really was important, solidarity in terms of the movements that are struggling for climate change, uh, against climate change, but also solidarity um, as part of a global, of a global movement. The tradition of internationalism within the trade union movement is incredibly important and standing alongside uh, our brothers and sisters internationally and not contributing um, to climate injustice by virtue of the solutions um, that we that we uh, call for is a very very important part of what trade unions need to be to be doing. Um, but I also think that um, secondly, trade unions have a job of militancy. Um, I think Alex, you mentioned that trade unions um, um, coined the phrase in the first instance, climate. Um, calling for a just transition. I, I'm not sure how many people realize that its roots lie in um, the work of uh, an American trade unionist in the 1980s, a uh, man whose name was Tony Mazzocchi. And um, he represented workers in the oil, chemical, atomic workers union. Um, there was the threat of a huge plant closure um, of a chemical facility in, in New Jersey. And the response, um, the chemical plant was, was being closed for environmental reasons. And Tony led a campaign in his union, which got taken up by the broader environmental movement um, and, uh, and, and elements of the trade union movement to call for a just transition. And, and what he was calling for was a super fund for workers where not just pay um, was guaranteed, but crucially um, investment would go into retraining so that workers could take up jobs in a um, government funded retraining 
uh, program which would retrain them for jobs what, which of, of, of socially useful, environmentally and ecologically useful um, purposes. And his argument was that people, that the training element of that and the transition to environmentally useful work um, was as important as protection, uh, protecting the, the pay of workers who had lost their, their, their jobs. Um, but in that context, he was criticized by fellow a number of fellow trade unions who found his position uh, the, or that position far too militant and um, he responded he was also anti-war um, he was also critical of the oil um, and the nuclear um, industry um, at that time 1980s in the US and um, he responded to that accusation of militancy um, by the, the, the following the following comment he said i've been accused of being a militant and i think that's a sad reflection of where we are i thought we would wear proudly the fact that we are militant i don't intend um to uh, bow down before any unjust company any unjust government or tyranny in any form that's my role um to the last of my to the last breath of my life and that's what trade unionism is all about now i mentioned that because there are clearly um a whole number of plans that have been um uh, very, very clearly identified of how we can make both a just transition and how we can also invest in new jobs. Um, and jobs which are not, as Robin mentioned earlier, a race to the bottom, a replication of the already unfair economy that we have, uh, one in which it's huge levels of wage inequality, uh, zero as contrast, deregulation, etc. But so there are a whole number of plans that identify um, the new jobs that can be created, the training that needs to be created. Um, Obviously, the work that we've done in Campaign Against Climate Change, our One Million Climate Jobs Report, it's now 10 years old, although updated. And then the work of many, many, many other groups. Robin's mentioned some of them in his presentation. So it feels to me that in many ways, the plans are there of the jobs that we need. The plans are there of the um, investment that we need. Um, it also feels to me that the money is there. And I think that one of the things that we have seen um, in the context of the, the, the COVID crisis is that every time the money tree is shaken, large amounts of money, huge amounts of volumes of money are, are available, but they are handed over to the public sector, often extremely waste, uh, sorry, to the private sector, often extremely wastefully. Um, many of the, the companies have been involved with the test track and trace around the response to COVID seem to have had billions um, which have not ended up um, solving any of the issues that we need resol resolving at this moment in time. So it does feel to me that you know there is so much in place but what we perhaps need is uh, a little bit of Tony um, Mazzocchi's um, inspiration and reminder that we do need militancy, um, that social change of the scale that we need and the urgency that we need um, needs a huge amount of solidarity, it needs a huge amount of organisation and it needs a willingness not to accept the lowest common denominator um, and most crucially at this moment in time when we are in a moment of extreme crises on a number of different levels, then that level of militancy, I feel, is the only way um, that we are going to be able to deliver this level of societal change that, 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 that we need alongside, obviously, the amazing, brilliant work that's already taken place in terms of planning what that would look like. And hopefully I haven't gone over time, Alex. No, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I really love that story about um, the creation of the concept of the Just Transition Commission, um, as I hadn't heard it before. Um, we had hoped to have um, Benny Tobot from Community Energy Scotland with us to speak about community ownerships, but unfortunately he has been unable to make it at the last minute. But the plus side is that leaves us for more room for questions. And um, 
Dr Jack has kindly agreed to come back and join us and um, so if you've got any more questions for him as well as for Suzanne and Robin and um, please just put them in the chat um, so I think I starting off on on the questions um, I think one of the questions that we have is a long time ago it was there was a time when you could rely on a job in the same sector, let alone the same company, um, but that seems to have gone. Um, how can unions adapt and attract and represent members who are in precarious working conditions like zero hour contracts and temporary contracts? So maybe one for you, Suzanne. Sorry, Alex, would you say that again? Would you repeat that? Oh, sorry. Um, the time when you could rely on a job in the same sector, um, let alone the same company, is long gone. Um, how can unions adapt to attract and represent members who are in precarious working conditions, or like zero-hour contracts or temporary contracts? Yeah, OK. Um, so let, let me answer that question, but also let me um, just comment on the uh, information that David Somerville has put into the, the chat there. The, um, the platform publication that was released last week that David's put a link to in, in the chat there um, is a really uh, amazing uh, piece of work. And it does kind of connect to the, to the, to the question that's been asked. So if, if people haven't seen it, um, it's been circulated quite a lot within the trade union movement and the environmental movement last week uh, basically through using social media uh, platform greenpeace i think we're also involved with it reached out to oil and gas workers uh, um it, uh, to to find out their attitudes to um their own jobs um where there have been quite a number of layoffs during the covid crisis and and their attitudes to just transition and quite um large numbers let me just get my figures that i wrote down earlier 81 percent of oil and gas workers would consider um moving to a job outside of oil of gas oil and gas and um the two top categories of work that um those who responded to the survey um said that would be top of their list to move into would be uh, offshore wind 53 percent 51 percent renewables and, and then it went down there were other other jobs as well it went down from there um i think i think in reality um the, the idea of jobs for life is actually a, a, a little bit of a myth um the nature of the economy um that we have had um neoliberal economy capitalist economy whatever is constantly restructuring um and the ability of workers to um both develop and maintain uh good pay terms and conditions has always been a function not of the nature of the economy at any given moment in time but has always been a function of the ability of workers to stand together to organize collectively um and to either win or to maintain pay, pay terms and pay, good pay terms and, and conditions so quite often those industries that are identified i'm a school teacher for example those industries that are identified as industries or, or, or workplaces in which um you know there's quite a, a high level of good pay terms and conditions usually have a history at some time not in the too recent past of um you know collective organization resistance struggle which uh, allowed those um industries to move to a a certain um level of of of, of job of job security or or usually more likely pay terms and and conditions that was certainly the case in the 19 sort of 60s and then again in the 1980s in terms of school teachers um for example using my own so i i, I think it's I, I i mean i'm kind of repeating myself but i do think it's um um it has to do with our ability to come together um, as workers to stand in solidarity with each other and that's clearly what's happening in a lot of the what are currently described as precarious employment you know where, where we've seen the beginnings of, um, of union organization um, happening in all kinds of industries that are, had up until this moment in time been un 
uh, ununionized. Uh, and when that happens, you know, gains can gains can be made. And equally in industries like uh, I don't know the airline industry at this moment in time. Um, uh, the big restructurings if 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 unions aren't willing to 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 organize against them will um re result in job losses and and will result in um a decline in in pay terms and conditions which is clearly what's happening in you know for example in the airline industry at this moment in time as as you know agreements are being made to reduce reduce pay and, and change um uh, and change terms of employment i'm going to stop there i'm going to stop there alex otherwise i will talk for too long Okay, no, that's really great. Thank you. Um, another question for um, Jack. Um, how much is resource waste down to overconsumption or just the unjust and unfair distribution of our resources? Uh, it's both. It's both. So we, um, we waste a huge amount. Um, you know, only 9% globally uh, is the amount of resources we recycle, not even reuse. And recycling, remember, is degrading your materials. Uh, and the other part is that, you know, the top five, ten percent wealthiest uh, population in the world, which includes Scottish citizens, um, is hugely, hugely disproportionately uh, resource heavy compared to uh, those uh, in other countries, and that then links to our climate impact. So there's a huge amount of waste, and, and I actually want to pick up the point on jobs uh, because that's where the where I see for the next 20, 30 years of economic opportunity is to reduce jobs and move away from extractive and pollutive industries to more green industries, particularly around the circular economy. Um, a report that Zero Waste Scotland did found that uh, 43, potentially 43,000 new jobs in the circular economy in Scotland alone. Um, and when we think of uh, the de decommissioning of oil and gas rigs, uh, oil rigs, um, that's 100,000 tonnes of steel. Uh, that's 100,000 tonnes of steel that we can use to build the entire fleet of wind turb offshore wind turbines by 2030. So we've got an amazing resource there and a huge amount of jobs that could produce stripping down, reprocessing the steel, building it back up into wind turbines and building a domestic industry. That's long-term jobs, that's domestic jobs, uh, and it's jobs that people can transition from the oil and gas industry into without displacing them geographically as well. So there's a huge amount we can do around reusing the materials we have without throwing them to landfill them or, or burning them. Uh, that's just one example. Another example is electric vehicles. You know. By the time the first uh, generation of electric vehicles come to end of life, those batteries are still 90 to 95% efficient. So we can strip those batteries, put them in households uh, to collect solar energy and other types of energy. And we can power our homes from remanufactured and reused electric vehicle batteries. Another huge thousands of jobs to do that. It's high skill labor and it's domestic. Um, so there's a huge amount of work we can do. It's all there, it just requires kind of a bit more macro thinking, and 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 we need to move fast on it to capture those 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 benefits. And we do. Then there's a dual benefit of cutting our waste, cutting our consumption, and providing jobs. Excellent. Um, one of the other questions that we have is, um, what can young people do, um, at the moment, um, considering the COVID crisis, um, to make themselves more employable? I think um, Robin, Suzanne, Jack, any of you who want to take them? Um, uh, well, I think the first thing is like, I, I don't envy anyone at all coming out of a, uh, coming out of school, coming out of college, university, anything in, into the jobs market right now it is, it's mega, mega, mega tough. So like my heart, the first thing is my heart just goes out, out to folk in that situation. Um, I mean, I think, I think it's, you're probably doing all the right things um like coming along to stuff like this um volunteering stuff like that taking what what work you can take um all of that we know makes a difference um i think yeah it's it's also just going to be 
be really tough and so um be kind to yourself keep persevering um i think speaking personally i think you know also be angry about stuff i think that that is a that's a good way to deal with with emotions as well and it is partly how you should feel um but yeah keep persevering and um, keep um uh, taking opportunities you can can take and um, keep volunteering keep um engaged in education in ways you can um and it and it, i mean we will get past this and you will get part of this past this and, and you will find good things I don't know if Suzanne or Jack have anything that they want to add. I'll, I'll just very quickly jump in and, and I, I did want to also just thank Jack for his comments earlier, which were you know, incredibly important, really helpful about about the, the huge scale of, of jobs that could be created um, in a circular economy and high skill jobs. And and, you know, we do need a we need a national climate service. We need a, a public sector employment. Um, and I mentioned earlier, these huge amounts of money that are washing ar around, but directed in the wrong direction. I still can't get over Boris Johnson's statement of his willingness to spend a hundred billion on a moonshot for some absolutely ridiculous scheme of, of, of testing very quickly discredited. Um, that's three quarters of the NHS annual budget. And that willing to, to that would have been handed over to private companies. Imagine if that money was spent on the jobs that Jack's identified, that Robin talked about, and addressing therefore the question that, that the young person has raised. How do you how how, how do you make yourself employable? I, I think young people are eminently already employable. As a school teacher, uh, uh, young people leave school, I think, m much more savvy and, and academically focused than I was at, at, at that age. They're eminently employable already. They're not being given the opportunities to be employed. And I, I don't think in with the scale of the crisis that we have at this moment in time that anybody should be unemployed. There should be nobody without work when we have such important work to do. So I'm, I'm sorry it doesn't give you um, guidance in terms of how to make yourself. Um, I feel you're employable and, and, I, and my heart, I feel the same as Robin in terms of this is a, this is a, um, a, a loss of opportunities for a generation of people which we really have to make sure it doesn't happen. Great, thank you. Um, is there a rule for a circular economy in climate justice on a global scale? Yes, <laughs> it's a simple answer. Um, yeah, so the, the circular economy is a very difficult um, thing to approach when you're talking about justice on a global basis, because on one hand, the circular economy is about capturing all the firstly reducing your consumption and bearing in mind that we're consuming a lot from abroad so we're supporting jobs abroad okay they may not be well paid poor labor bad working conditions potentially slave labor conditions and um, that's a separate issue but you're still supporting a local economy somewhere else and so there's a bit of a dichotomy there and that we will actually want to close our resources resource loop domestically so therefore you're taking away potential job opportunities abroad um, but at the same time our, our consumption of say rare earth metals and the mining of cobalt in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo where there's thousands of child labor uh, children working in horrific mines uh, to make our iPhones um, you know that's a ma you know that's a massive issue that we have to address and we can address that by significantly reducing our consumption. So it's if anyone tells you the circular economy is just the silver bullet that will address you know, social justice all over the world, it's not. And, and it can have really massive environmental be benefits here, but at the expense of others abroad. And that's where um, I think there's, there's got to be a lot of joined up thinking, uh, you know, 
at the UK level probably, but also at the Scottish level in terms of its international development support. Uh, so working in bilateral and multilateral uh, agreements, uh, trade agreements, building in these uh, requirements and, and clauses so that um, if we are procuring goods from different countries, it comes with much more stringent uh, sustainability and social justice measures. And uh, there's a particular role in public procurement. You know, Scotland has a 12 billion pound a year public procurement spend, which is 10% of our GDP. And we buy a lot of stuff uh, in the public sector. So, and a lot of that comes from abroad. So there's a real uh, potential role of this, uh, you know, public procurement in driving more sustainable consumption and more sustainable uh, and ethical trade relationships with other countries, but also uh, driving local uh, jobs in repair and reuse, remanufacturing supply chains for all the stuff we've already procured. That was a really long-winded answer because I don't really have a simple answer to it, but um, the answer is yes and no, it's complicated. Great. Um, I've got a question from David. So can the panel share ways for getting involved with change making that Robin mentions? Um, he's thinking of joining in with the Just and Green Recovery, which involves 83 sub-society networks with the five asks of the Scottish Minister, um, things like the Week of Action coming up on the 4th to 11th November and the UKY Build Back Better Coalition. What other ways can young people engage? I'll jump in. Um, so I think uh, I should say this, if you are in a job, you should definitely join a union um, and get involved with organising within that union. Um, there's so much impact that needs to be made within the trade union movement as well as by the trade union movement. Um, and then I would also strongly uh, flag up uh, COP26 um, which uh, we don't know you know how it will um, configure itself in terms of the possibilities uh, of, of, of street protest uh, um, I, I'm pretty sure it'll take place and I'm pretty sure uh, that we have to make sure that we have big 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 deep broad coalitions in place mobilizing from now so that these kind of debates discussions that we've had here um raise up some 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 you know some very significant demands um on both the the countries participating in cop 26 and also on our, on our own uh, governments that are hosting um cop 26 in in november of 2021 so i'd say definitely get involved with any um co coalitions uh, and organizations locally obviously there's the cop 26 coalition um which many groups are involved with which will you know will be doing and lots of things got some online summits coming up in, in november so um yeah cop 26 coalition i'll i'll i'll, I'll pop it into the to the chat uh, i'll just jump in really briefly which is um yeah, I think like there's there's loads of campaigning stuff that, that Suzanne's given a really good overview of. Um, add to the list a uh, uh, Stop Climate Chaos Scotland. That's kind of the coalition of the various charities that that do kind of campaigning work on on climate change in Scotland. And then um, going to some of those organisations like Friends of the Earth and stuff. Uh, obviously, have, have memberships and stuff, and they they get involved both locally and nationally, and lots lots of kind of campaign stuff. Um, I suppose the other thing I was going to, uh, or oh, and also on the kind of like practical doing stuff. Um, there's a um, kind of look at all your uh, kind of more nature environment charities like uh, the Scottish Wildlife Trust and RSPB and stuff and uh, there's lots of kind of smaller groups and that and that do lots of kind of practical stuff if you want to be kind of more hands-on about it um, and that's all going to give you loads of stuff too. Um, I was going to kind of pipe up for something I think is a bit less often thought of which is like um, I think with all this climate change stuff is like there's a real I, I wouldn't underestimate how difficult kind of decision makers um, find it to ac actually just it's partly to get the space and partly to convert these big ideas into practical things that they feel like there's a, a demand for from local people, like kind of deliverable local policy, I, I mm -hmm. sort of think. Um, 
and it, particularly in Scotland, like there's there's very little kind of lobbying and influencing that the kind of the formal power structures do of um, lo uh, local authorities in particular. And there's very little ability for local authorities to kind of do um, kind of policy development. And um, so basically what I'm saying is um, I really want to hear your ideas for um, like stuff that would just deliver on a green recovery, on green skills, on green jobs. And also I'm saying like, um, look on your local authorities consultation pages about what they're consulting about now. Or like, do they like uh, Edinburgh did stuff um, a little while ago about kind of visionary stuff. There's the local authorities are always doing stuff about kind of placemaking and about redesigning streets and local areas and stuff. But they, they don't also people don't shout at them about kind of um, skills and jobs type stuff. And um, so like take a take one of these big global reports or something and think about how it applies to your local area and then come up with something deliverable and go and talk to one of your local councillors, talk to officials in your local authority and sort of say, why can't you do this? Why aren't you doing this? Listen to why they say not and then figure out what the comebacks are and, and just like keep keep on with it and like show them that there is demand for this stuff locally. Yeah, can I can I just add to that, Robin? Um, so, if it's okay, uh, Faye, I'm going to share my screen because uh, I, I I mentioned in my presentation I produced this kind of compendium of all the recommendations from you know all the different interest groups, uh, climate emergency response group, just transition commission, uh, you name it, they're in there, and um, you know Robin made a very good suggestion that you kind of pick you find something that you can translate into a local context and take it to your local council, local authority, uh, and really try and figure out a way to do it. This, this what I published here, um, you probably can't see in enough detail, but it, it's basically got your entire list of everything recommended, um, categorized into all the different um, categories. So depending on your expertise or your interest, drill down into those, find the very specific recommendations and lift them uh, and, and work with the local authorities. And in the database that I provide, it's got the link to the, whoever recommended this. So you've got a bit of, uh, you know, legitimacy and backing because you can say this has been recommended by such and such and such. So uh, it's a really useful resource. I've made it freely available. So just uh, go ahead and dive in if you, or if you want me to send the, the raw data, just let me know. That really helpful thank you um thank you all for all of your sort of comments um i think we've got time for one last question and it's from erica um i think suzanne might have already engaged with us a little bit on the chat so do you believe the factors contributing to young people struggling to get jobs mentioned with regards to scotland are also seen in other countries and do you think that there's anything we can learn from those other countries Um, I definitely say, either job oh sorry Robin yeah yeah um, I I think it, you know it's, it's something we just don't we we don't spend long enough kind of learning from other other countries far from it um, so I don't know enough about whether I mean the, the the economic and employment stuff a lot of it is so fundamental and a lot of it is created by uh, sorry, f fundamental, particularly in, in my opinion, to, to the coronavirus, like, like for sure, from like what Suzanne was saying, like there's definitely a, a, a strong viewpoint that it's 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 it goes further than that. And um, but just the fact that like uh, the way that coronavirus has impacted lockdowns, that inevitably leads to um, to an economic impact in it that inevitably, unless governments take action, leads to to greater unemployment or at least le le leads to jobs being lost that then need to be substituted by governments taking other interventions and um, i think on the skill stuff like definitely some of serg's work uh, the climate emergency response groups work was definitely informed by um some of the stuff that that, that they do in germany and um, vocational learning in germany tends to have a lot more of a um an off the job element to it um, so you you get a much bigger combination between what you learn in the classroom and what you learn in the, in the kind of workplace, um, and I think that is really important because it, it it's because this chicken and egg thing. Like if um, if your apprenticeship takes you into a workplace, that's a workplace of the kind of the current moment, and it might be a forward thinking workplace, but you need to also get skills um, that prepare you for all these different technological, economic, social changes, including that zero, but not the only one. That are going to take place over over the next wee while. So, um, 
there's that. I definitely also the um, some of the stuff about the um, uh, there's an ecological year that you can take in in Germany. Um, some of that comes from uh, uh, some of their historical legacy that and the way that they approach approach nat national service. Um, so national service in the military is is one of the things that that is um, that the concept of national service is compulsory as I understand it. Um, but mil military service is only one of your options. You can also take a social social year, or you can take what they call an ecological year. And in the, if you take the ecological year option, what you often get is a kind of um, a work a work placement that's being created um, by uh, an environmental charity or something like that. So you might be uh, it might be kind of public engagement work, or it might be very practical, kind of helping in a nature reserve or or, or something like that, and you get very practical skills from it. Um, and so, yeah, like for, they're just some of the things that I, I have learned from other other experiences. There's also a lot of talk about um, some of the ways that other countries are designing and uh, forming some of their um, their economic interventions around the job creation and job protection side of things, and what the UK and what Scotland can learn about about those. So, th there's loads. Is the short answer? Great, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, so. That is basically us for the day. Um, I hope you have found it as interesting as I have. Um, a massive thank you to all of our speakers who have given us so much of their time and have provided us with such information, interesting information. Um, two of my fellow volunteers have been scribbling away furiously to make notes um, so that there will be a follow-up email um, with a summary of what we've discussed and this email will also have a link to some of the resources and organisations mentioned by our speakers in the talk today. Um, I wanted to also say a quick thank you um, to some of our funders, in particular CIFA, um, Scottish Government and Zero Waste Scotland, um, whose support means that we can organise events like today. Um, we also have a link um, for feedback um, which should hopefully be in the follow-up email um, and is on your screen now. We would be really grateful if you could take a couple of minutes and just fill out our quick survey. Um, we appreciate all the feedback that we receive um, from people who attend our events and we take it very seriously. Um, any feedback that we get would be really useful in shaping our future events. We do have another event um, in our Climate Justice for a Positive Future series. Um, the next event will take a more personal approach. I understand that our next event will be shaped around our personal reflections on our experience with coronavirus, and we'll examine how the pandemic has affected our motivations and capacity for climate action. We'll also be inviting participants from our sister project in Malawi to the next event so that we can learn from the reflections of those in the global south. So look out on our social media and our website for more details of that coming soon. Um, thanks again for joining us and thank you again to all of our speakers. Um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon everyone.